First of all, I just want to tell you how excited I am to be sharing with you something that I'm extremely passionate about. You know, um, this is, we're going to discover some fascinating truths today about the Bible. It's going to be absolutely amazing. As you know, we're going to be answering a very big question. The question is, is the Bible scientifically accurate? That's kind of a big question to ask, isn't it? Because it's a strange question to ask, because most of us would say, well, isn't the Bible kind of a religious book? It's about God, Jesus, His love and redemption and, and plan for humanity. Isn't that what the Bible is all about? It's all about kind of miracles, supernatural stuff, things you can't explain. Isn't that what the people think? Well, it's true. It's all those things and a lot more. Uh, you know, um, the Bible is, in fact, scientifically accurate on top of all of those things. I get some people telling me sometimes, do you really think that the Bible is scientifically accurate? Can you show me one scientific fact in the Bible? And my usual response is immediately, you can't even do science without the Bible. I know it's a strange thing to say, you can't even do science without the Bible. You see, to do science, you need two special ingredients. You need to have, um, the first thing you need is a reliable universe and a consistent universe. You need to have those two ingredients for you to be able to do an experiment today and yield the same result tomorrow. You need to have those ingredients in the universe. And uh, of course, we take those things for granted. We don't think about those things, but this is what you need in a universe to do experiments and to do scientific uh, discoveries. Now, why would a universe that's just come out of one big chaotic accident have those ingredients? Well, the universe doesn't owe us anything. Why should it be there? You see, in a biblical worldview, God promises that he will be the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that the Bible says the universe is held together by his power. You see, well, that's very important if you want to repeat an experiment today that you did yesterday and get the same results. And because he is his consistent God, I know that I have a consistent universe. I have the laws of physics, they're consistent. The laws of biology, the laws of logic, the laws of astronomy. I have a universal, consistent principle that I can apply to this galaxy as well as anywhere else in the universe. It's consistent throughout the whole universe. You see, when I do those, when I have those principles in hand, I can now do experiments that are intelligible and mathematically predictable. And that's the kind of thing we're going to find out today. You see, God who promises that as long as the world remains, the uniformity and consistency of the universe also remains. Well, kind of a foundation there to set out. Now, I'm not saying those people who don't believe in the Bible cannot do science. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that they're relying on a principle that they cannot account for and they cannot explain why it exists. You see, in a universe that doesn't owe us anything, we don't expect to get the same results and the consistent results throughout the universe. Why should we have a universal law, a law that applies and it's consistent throughout the whole universe? Why should we have that? Why is, does the universe obey those laws? And why should it be consistent? And who is the lawgiver anyway? Why should it be all there? But in a Christian worldview, it all makes sense. These laws are a reflection on, on the way that God thinks, and seeing that we're made in His image, we are given the same ability for us to be able to make those discoveries. So here's, this is what's uh, fascinating. This is what Einstein said. He said the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. You see, it blew Einstein's mind. He already thought, whoa, I don't understand why I understand it. It is just very fascinating. Why would it happen if it was one big accident? It all makes sense in a biblical worldview. I've been studying now creation and evolution, uh, this, uh, this subject, for years. I've spent thousands of hours on this subject, and you'll be pleased to know I haven't gone mad yet. It is very mind-blowing. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot to do out there. And the more I do debates on this subject and the more I study, the more I discover that the Bible is accurate scientifically. Every word in the Bible is accurate. Now, before I start, I want to lay down some ground rules here. I want to state my position very clearly. You see, I believe that the Bible is the infallible, inspired word and inerrant word of the living God. And I believe that the Bible has no contradictions. Not only that, that I, I also believe that the Bible is in, in its entirety uh, inspired by God, not just the parts that I actually like in the Bible. You know, I love it when people come to me and say, you know, the Bible is just made up. 
It's made up by people, just man written it. It's just made up, put together. And usually my response to that is that if it's all made up, then the guy who's written it done a lousy job. Because if I was writing a Bible or a book and I claim that it came from a supernatural being who doesn't exist, I'll be telling people to do what they like. I wouldn't be going out there and doing rules about do's and don'ts, and if you don't do those things, there'll be a judgment day at the end of the day that you pay for it all. I wouldn't do that. I'd say, go enjoy yourself. Do what you like. That's how I would write a book if I was making it up, wouldn't I? I wouldn't write down all these rules and regulations and make it difficult. You see, the Bible is written as if there is a creator who loves his creation and he wants them to do well. And this is just absolutely fascinating. Right, I believe the Bible cover to cover, word for word, page for page. In fact, I use an iPad, so I believe my Bible bite for bite. I'm glad I got a laugh out of that one. <laughs> I wasn't sure that was going to work. Okay. <laughs> okay, now, does that mean everything in the Bible is literally true? No, it doesn't. But it does mean that it is true literally. So, I'm going to explain to you what that means. Well, you see, the Bible has a lot of information in it. Some of it is historic, some of it, some of it is prophetic, some of it is poetic, some of it is symbolic, figurative, and even scientific, and so on. So the Bible is full of those information. So when the Bible talks about history, it's talking about something that happened in the past. Now, when it's not talking about something that it happens in the past, it will be talking about something in the future, and that won't be history, that will be what? Prophecy. That will be prophecy. When it's telling you about the future, then it's prophecy. Let me give you an example. In Psalm 16, 5, it says, O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. Is this literally true? No, it is not literally true. What is it? It is poetry. It is poetry. It makes, uh, if this statement was literally true, then this writer is saying that God of Israel is a drinking utensil. Now, of course, it's not because that would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? It's just poetry. It's just a metaphor of a cup. You see, the writer is describing a relationship with God. That's what he's doing. Let's me, let me give you another example. In Psalm 91.4, it says, He shall cover you with his feather, and under his wings you shall take refuge. Is this literally true? Of course not. And what kind of language is it? It is symbolic. It is symbolic. If the statement were literally true, then God of Israel is a feathered animal. And that's ridiculous because... Our God is not a feathered animal. The Bible says that he is spirit in John 4, 24. So it's just symbolic. I'll give you one last example. In Matthew 26, 26, it says, Jesus took bread and said, take, eat, this is my body. Is this literally true? Right. Is that bread literally his body? No. If it were, it would be cannibalism, wouldn't it? So it isn't. What language is it? It's figurative. I hope you're getting it now. Um, likewise, parable that Jesus talks about is just trying to illustrate a point that Jesus is making in the Bible. Okay, so what do Christians believe? Well, Christians believe in the plain and straightforward reading of the Bible. That's plain, simple, and straightforward. That's how we read it, the way God intended, it for, intended us to understand it. So, of course, it doesn't mean that it doesn't contain very deep and very profound truths. No wonder the scholar said, the Bible is simple enough that a child could wade in a shallow end, yet profound enough that scholars could spend a lifetime exploring its depth. This one said, the scriptures are um, shallow enough for a babe to come and drink with, without fear of drowning, and deep enough for theologians to swim in without ever reaching the bottom. And how about this one? The Bible is simple enough for a child to read and too deep for a scholar to master. You see, our God is a real good God. He can make those things happen. He can make it simple enough for us to understand and deep enough for the experts not to reach the bottom. So, the big question we're going to answer today is this. Is the Bible scientifically accurate? That's what we're going to answer. Let me, ask you a big, let me ask you some questions now, and I need some responses here, okay? Is the Bible a science book? No, it isn't. Okay. Is the Bible inspired by God? Okay. For those who believe in it, obviously, agree with that. Okay. But who invented science? God invented science. So if God refers to science in the Bible, would it be accurate? Okay. So is the Bible scientifically accurate? Okay. I think we all agree. So that was good. That was a quick lesson. So thank you very much for coming, and uh, that should be all. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not going to let you off that easily. I've got a lot more to go. So we're going we're gonna to go straight into this and prove my point, okay? We're going to explain to you the different 
aspects of what I'm saying. You see, people who think that the Bible is not scientifically accurate either don't know much about science, and I encourage you to go and get some. You don't know much about the Bible, and I encourage you to read it, or you don't know both. Today, I will be showing you how the Bible is scientifically accurate. Maybe one day I'll come back and talk to you how we know the, that there are no contradictions in the Bible. I do those debates quite a bit, and it's quite laughable when some people actually bring up some uh, contradictions they think it is a contradiction, when actually clearly it isn't. Okay, if the Bible is true and it's inspired by God, then it must be scientifically accurate. I think we all agree with that. And not only that, it should also be able to make some scientific predictions. You see, what we're going to do in the first half, I'm going to be telling you about how the Bible is scientifically accurate, and then the second half, we're going to do on top of that a little bit of prediction, scientific predictions based on our knowledge of the Bible. But um, for now, this is, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do for the first half. Today, I'm going to show you how the Bible is scientifically accurate in those fields. It's going to be in physics, oceanography, which is the study of the sea, hydrology, that's a study of distribution of water on Earth. Next one is meteorology, uh, study of atmosphere and weather conditions, astronomy, biology, the study of life, organisms, plants and animals, and geometry. That's going to be our first half. So as we go through this, you'll see how we're reaching the end. So remember, geometry is where we're going to finish. And then the second half, we're going to go for a geology, which is the study of rocks and earth, um, the science of earth, paleontology, study of fossils, chemistry, archaeology, study of human history through excavation and artifacts and medicine. You're going to find out that the Bible is accurate in every one of those fields. It's, quite, it's not challenging at all, actually. It's been quite an easy thing to put together. Look, the more familiar you are with science, the easier the Bible reads, and the more comfortable you are, particularly with the uh, Genesis account of creation. You'll be pleased to know that I'll only be giving you one or two examples per one of those fields, so we're not going to be long. It's going to be a very brief uh, description for each one of those. Okay, the Bible says in Job 38, 19, where is the way to the dwelling of light? Well, that's interesting because it's saying light is in a way. It's always moving. And it says, as for the darkness, where is its place? You see, God is saying light is in a way and darkness has a place. You see, light moves and darkness doesn't. Right, what's the speed of light, everybody? It's a very fast, very fast speed. It's 186,282.4 miles per second. That's very high speed. Now, what's the speed of darkness? It's zero. It doesn't go very fast and very far. You know what? I always wanted to invent a dark bulb. I really did. <laughs> I've always wanted to invent a dark bulb. It would be very handy if we had a dark bulb here. You switch it on, and even if it's light outside, it makes the room dark and you can have put a projector on it, people could see it. It's a very useful invention, but dark doesn't travel very far, so it doesn't tend to work. Okay, what's really interesting is this. The original Hebrew word for way, which is derech. Now turn to somebody and tell them derech. Okay, Try, don't spit on them as you do that. That means, by the way, travel, path, or road, and darkness means, in, in Hebrew, it's makom, it's easy, let's have a makom which means place, spot, or standing. Okay, that's what it means. Until about the 16th century, all right, not long ago, we thought that light just appeared. It was an instant thing. It was just there. It always just happened. Until Isaac Newton came along and he said, no, I think light is made of small particles. Today we know the actual answer. The day is light is a form of a radiant energy that does in fact travel in waves. God told us about this three thousand years ago. How did he know? Because he made it, obviously. Is the Bible right? Of course it is. Is it scientifically accurate? Absolutely. The Bible says in Job 38, 35, can you send out lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are. Well, that's interesting. What is God saying here? He's saying that electricity can be used to send messages. That's what it's saying. Is that true? Well, of course, just about every message we send out there today is done with electricity. Whether it's telephone, emails, fax, everything is done with electricity. In fact, lightning is not just a flow of electricity, but according to NASA, lightning also generates radio waves. And radio wave communication signals can travel through the air and are used in radio, television, navigation, air traffic control, mobile phones, and even toys. 
You mean electricity can be used to send messages and go along and talk to you? Well, it looks like it's just like the Bible said 4,000 years ago. The Bible revealed this fact to us 4,000 years ago. You see, there are many messages around here today, right now. It's going through the air right now. If you had the right instrument, you would listen. You would hear it straight away right now. It's all happening. It's flowing in the air. So is the Bible scientifically accurate? Absolutely. The Bible is 100% accurate. The Bible is accurate in physics, clearly. So far, we've done physics. Now, let's have a look at oceanography. Job 38:16. God said, have you entered the springs of the sea? What does the springs of the sea mean? The word spring in Hebrew means nafech. Guess what I'm going to make you do? <laughs> Turn to someone and say nafech. All right. <laughs> uh, and it means the fountains of the sea. That's what it means. The fountains. Of the sea. That's where the water came during Noah's flood, shooting from the bottom of the under the earth crust called, the, that the Bible refers to as the fountains of the great deep that were broken up. In 1977, a group of scientists from Oregon. Uh, from Oregon State University, discovered a hot water shooting into, a, uh, into the bottom of the sea at the Galapagos Rift west of Ecuador under two miles under the sea, just under two miles. They called it the geothermal vents or hydrothermal vents. And um, some of you might have heard about this. But since then, they found other similar ones in, in places like Indian, Pacific, and North Atlantic. But the but bear in mind that God told, this, God said, told us this 4,000 years ago, well before science caught up. We're talking about 1977, and the Bible revealed to us this 4,000 years ago. Most people wonder where the water came from during the flood. Now, if the Bible tells us that the water came from under the crust, um, and you're looking at water shooting from under the water, where is that water coming from? It's coming below the crust of the sea. So it's coming below the surface of the earth. So that means we still have water right there under the surface of the earth that the Bible told us about that happened during the days of Noah when it was shooting from underneath the earth. Suddenly, verses like this start making sense. The earth is the Lord's, and he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Is the Bible scientifically accurate or not? The Bible is scientifically accurate. It gets more interesting. When you see the rest of this verse in uh, Job 38, 16, it says, Have you entered the springs of the sea, or have you walked in search of the depth? In the original Hebrew, it actually says, Have you walked in the most secret recess of the sea? The word recess means hidden or only found through investigation. That's what it's saying. So what does that mean? Well, it turned out until recently, they thought that the bottom of the sea is dead straight. They didn't know. They thought between the continents, it was one sandy beach all the way from one continent to another. But in 1875, a, a team of British scientists in the Pacific Ocean found the first of these recesses that the Bible talks about over five miles deep. A few years later, they found another recess about six miles deep. These are discoveries that they're making just now to, to, um, to match what the Bible is saying. And now the deepest recess known is in the Mariana Trench off the coast of Guam. That's nearly seven miles deep. That's a, a recess in the ocean that's seven miles deep. I've got to point this out. This is as deep as the highest mountain, as, as high as Mount Everest. That is quite deep, isn't it? It turns out that under the sea, it's full of these mountains. The pink areas are the deepest. They are, these are just seas. These are just mountains under the seas right over here. The pink area is not very obvious on this screen. This is a closer look. Have a look at this to get a better idea. You're looking at the Atlantic Ocean and the Caribbean Sea. This is Florida for those people who want to get their bearings right. And this purple sea floor is the deepest part of the Atlantic Ocean. Doesn't it look like mountains under the sea right there? And just to give you a comparison, this is what Mount Everest looks like. It looks absolutely unbelievable. It's like looking at mountains under the sea. Suddenly, the verses make, these kind of verses make sense. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. Jonah was talking about the mountains in the seas. That's what he's talking about, which we only discovered 150 years ago. Is the Bible scientifically accurate? 
apparently it is scientifically accurate. So the Bible is accurate in oceanography. Well, what about in hydrology? Is the Bible accurate when it comes to the subject of hydrology? Well, in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 7, all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the river come, they, there they return again. Well, how does it do that? How does the river run into the sea, and then where the river comes from, it goes back again to where it started? Again, it says, he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of treasures, out of his treasures. It's very interesting. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. So God called, God called the waters from the sea and pours it back into the face of the earth. Have you all worked out what it's trying to tell us? We have a scientific term for this behavior right now, and it's called the hydrologic cycle or it's called the water cycle. But Bible told us about this cycle over 3,000 years ago. How did he know? He must have put it in place. Water goes into the ocean, evaporates, rains on land, goes into the river, and straight back into the ocean. So the water is constantly being circulated and recycled. It's been doing this for thousands of years. In that time, I want you to think about this, billions of people have lived. And during this time, how many people have drank the same water that you're drinking? That's quite a lot. You see, it's probably been drunk by dozens of people before you, and some of them are not even human. Nice thought, isn't it? I want you to think about this. What normally happens after you drink water, after a while? Okay, you work it out for yourself. Okay, no wonder the Bible says who he calls for the, waters, uh, for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. The Lord is his name. God is probably trying to tell us something here. He's probably telling us that he is God and we are not. Is the Bible scientifically accurate? Yes, I think you'll find it's accurate. Is the Bible scientifically accurate in hydrology? Yes, it is. Well, we're going to have a look at the next one. This is meteorology. This is a study of atmosphere and weather conditions. So let's see what the Bible tells us about this. In Job 38, it says, by, by, by what way is the light parted which scatters the east wind upon the earth? What is it talking about? Is the light causing the wind? Is that what the Bible is saying? Well, if you ask any weatherman, he will tell you that light comes from the sun expands the air and it rises and as it rises it pulls other air behind it and as it does that it creates the wind pattern that we see today on earth all this is happening from the sun which is 93 million miles away and god told us this 4,000 years ago the wind goes towards the south and turns around the north the wind uh, whirls about continually and comes again into its circuit so what is the wind doing now Apparently, the wind blows, it whirls a bit, and then it comes back to where it started. That's what it's saying it's doing. Well, that's interesting. Did you know that we have actually a scientific term for this? And the scientific term for this is called the Coriolis effect. And we named this in 1912. We named this Coriolis effect in 19. Before 1912, this verse would have not meant a lot for people who would have read it. In fact, they would have complained about this verse because they can't understand it. What could have God, what could have God meant in this verse? They wouldn't have understood it. So you see, hot air rises. And it's a good job too, because hot air balloons would look silly if that didn't happen. And cold air sinks, and that's how smoke machines work. They use dry ice, and because it's cold, it sinks. The air near the equator generally goes up because it's hot, and around the south and north pole, it comes down because it's cold. Mix that with the earth rotation and you get this remarkable Coriolis effect. You see, sailing ships generally have a hard time when it comes to the equator because the air goes straight up and they stop and they can't move anymore. But what happens is that it goes up, it goes across the north and, and uh, south poles, splits, comes down, and you can study all of that. But God told us about this over 3,000 years ago. It explained the Coriolis effect. Solomon said, the wind whirls around and gets back where it started. And that is exactly what it does. So, is the Bible scientifically accurate? Yes, it is. 
by the time I finish, I'm going to get you to all say yes as I ask a question. In Proverbs 8.26, the Bible says, While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. What is that talking about? It's talking about the highest dust of the world. Now, I want you to think about this. When I think about dust, I think about it as the lowest part. I, look, I think about it as being on the floor, the lowest part of the dust. God said the highest if you ask any weather expert, they will tell you that's exactly how we get rain. They tell you that there is dust in the highest part of the atmosphere. In fact, to get rain, you need these particles of dust. The dust particles are called condensation nuclei. Very fancy word. These droplets have to collect around those dust so that we can get rain, and without them, without the the, uh, these parts, the highest part of the world, you would not get rain at all. Look at this article in January last year. It says, scientists discovered how to create downpours in the desert, a place where it doesn't rain very often. They tell what they do, they ionize some particles so that they attach them to dust and send them high up in the atmosphere and they cause it to rain. And without it, without the highest part of the dust, you cannot get rain, and that's how they create a downpour. They just create some ionized dust particles, send them up in the air, collects around the dust, and comes down, pouring down. And the Bible told us this over 3,000 years ago. Isn't that incredible? Is the Bible scientifically accurate? Yes. Okay, we're getting there. I'll keep doing this. You see, this will go much shorter if you just agree with me. Okay, Isaiah 4 says, It is he who sits upon the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Now, is the earth round? Of course it is. The word for circle is kuch. Turn around, tell somebody kuch. That's it. <laughs> Which it means a circle, a sphere, a vault, or an arc. It means those things. Christians have always known that the earth is round. Absolutely every one of them. And you know why? Because they read the Bible. Okay? They, they know the Bible. But believe it or not, it is today that people have got problems with the earth being round. Did you know that there is a flat earth society today promoting? It's a whole society, an organization. Their main purpose is to tell people that the earth is flat. These people need to get out more. You thought that's interesting. Well, listen to this, right? The head of the organization is called Daniel Shenton. And guess what? He is an evolutionist. And that's just embarrassing. It really is. And they tell you that evolution is science. Here's a guy who thinks that it's flat. And they also say so there are people out there who are worried that they teach creation in classrooms. And yet we have people who believe in flat earth, who are, who are evolutionists. And you know, you will get this from time to time. You're talking to people, and they tell you they're not going to go, and, and uh, we don't want to believe, we don't want to listen to Christians. These are people who used to think the earth is flat. We don't want to go back to those days, dark ages and all that. And did you know that the whole idea that Christians promoted the idea that the earth is flat was a lie that was made in the 1800s? Did you know that? And this lie was created by two guys, mainly um, these two guys, John Draper and... Uh, um, Andrew Dixon White, and later on, an honest evolutionist out of, of all people, he actually highlighted this issue to fix it. And um, unfortunately, there are very many uneducated people out there who are still promoting the idea that Christians promoted the flat earth concept. And he said their main goal was to discredit Christians who opposed Darwinism. That's all they wanted to do. These two guys wanted to, hide, they wanted to embarrass Christians because they couldn't hack the idea that Christians don't believe in Darwinism. So they made up this story. Somebody needs to, next time somebody tells you that Christians believe in flat earth, remind them that the flat earth society, the head is actually an evolutionist. You will find that the Bible is scientifically accurate indeed. In Jeremiah 33, 22, it says, the host of heaven cannot be numbered. Okay, so what is it talking about? It's saying that the stars are too numerous for us to count. There are too many stars for us to sit there and count. That's what it's saying. The Bible's saying that the stars are too numerous to count. Is this true? Well, let's find out. On the 15th of January, 1997, NASA astrophysicist team, that's the entire team, they were asked this question. How many stars are there named and unnamed known to exist? You know what the answer was? 
you need to see the answer. The answer is this. This is a very good question. There are too many stars for scientists to actually count one by one. No kidding. Is that what the Bible said, that we can't count them? That's exactly what it said. What a coincidence that it's exactly what the Bible says. It goes on to say, so other methods of estimating the total number of stars are used. Do you know why? Because they can't count them. And that is exactly what the Bible said thousands of years ago. In Job 38, it's talking about the earth now. It says, who laid its corners, cornerstone when the morning stars sang together? This is an interesting verse. I'm aware that this verse has got many theological meanings or other theological meanings, but the question is this, do stars actually sing? That's a question. Well, apparently they do. In 1932, that's about 80 years ago, NASA discovered that stars and other objects in space radiate radio waves. What's fascinating, according to this book, is that NASA discovered to their amazement that not only are these stars emitting radio wave energy, but, they are, but there is music in those radio wave of energy. NASA also discovered that not only is the music emitted, but the music being emitted is in a major key. The music being emitted from these stars is harmonious. They're singing in harmony, okay? NASA also compared the music being emitted from these star sources to the instruments of an, instru uh, of an orchestra that are all in tune with each other. You are kidding me. Well, that God told us this over 4,000 years ago. Well, next time you're in a church and your worship leader does a great job and leads worship, just go to them and say, you are a star. So long as they sing in harmony, of course. Is the Bible scientifically accurate? Of course it is. Thank you. <laughs> Did you know there, are there was time when people thought that there were seven Earths resting on top of each other? And that the whole lot rested on a snake with a thousand heads called Shishakya? And that this snake felt no pain? <laughs> Some tough snake this is. Some believe that the earth was supposed, uh, supported by a giant turtoise, which is possibly on top of a giant snake again. Why can't they leave these animals alone? Uh, like, how about this one? The earth stands on a whale, the whale stands on water, the water stands on a rock, the rock stands on a bull, uh, and the bull stands on a smooth, on, a, on the ground. I guess the cycle starts all over again. Once you're at the ground, then it goes all the way to the top. That's quite fascinating, isn't it? Uh, there was a well-known scientist called Bertrand Russell once was giving a, a lecture on, on astronomy, and he was just simply teaching people how the, um, the Earth revolves around the sun and the sun around the center of the galaxy and spinning all the way around. And at the end of that lecture, a little old lady stood up at the back and she said, uh, what you just told us is rubbish. Everybody knows that the Earth is a flat plate and it's the rest on top of a giant turtle. And the scientist smiled, and he said, um, and what is that turtle standing on? And she said, you're a very clever young man. You're very clever. But it's turtles all the way. <laughs> That's <laughs> it's a true story, apparently. But the Bible says in Job 26, 7, the, he hangs the earth on nothing. And then it goes on to say, to what were its foundation fastened? We know that the earth rests on nothing now, but this was only confirmed in the 1950s when the space program took off. And God told this to Job over 4,000 years ago. Is the Bible scientifically accurate in astronomy? Yes, it is. In fact, the Bible is accurate in every field, as you will find out uh, in a few minutes. Let's have a look at biology. Who knows what bloodletting is? Bloodletting. Okay, bloodletting. It's this theory that the human body was filled with four basic substances called humors. Uh, the, the four humors are black bile, yellow bile, phlegm, and blood. They believe that if you have too much of one and not so much of the other, you become an unbalanced person. It will affect your health and your personality. And of course, it's not true. Okay, we know better now. But you see, in the past, when patients suffered from any disease, including those wounded from battle, they used to blood, they used to let them bleed. They used to uh, do this bloodletting technique on them. And of course, many of them would die because of that. It was very common for 2,000 years up to and including the 19th century. Absolutely incredible. The picture you're looking at here is one of the three known photos of bloodletting actually being performed 
1860. One of the people who died from this is George Washington. He's the first president of the United States. The doctor came to his house to start taking his blood at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and he was dead by 10 past 10 at night. But the Bible told us in Leviticus chapter 17, the life of the flesh is in the blood. God told us that 3,000 years ago. You see, guess what actually George Washington really died from? He actually died from a cold. It was laryngitis. Good old George, if he had a Bible-believing, God-fearing doctor, he may have not died. Well, not that day anyway. The Bible is accurate in every scientific field. We're going to look at geometry, and that's going to be the last one before we have our break. The Bible says, Solomon made a molten sea of 10 cubits from brim to brim, round in compass, and 5 cubits in the height, and line of 30 cubits did compass it around about. Basically, the Bible is saying that Solomon made this amazing, huge brass, and it was 10 cubits in diameter and 30 in its circumference, okay, round about. A cubit is the length of your elbow up to the tip of your finger, and here's the problem. If, the, if it's 10 cubits across, like the Bible is saying it is, then it should be 31 cubits round. You see, not 30, it shouldn't be 30. That's because it's working off pi, and pi is a mathematical constant that's about 3.1415, whatever. It's kind of many decimal digits. And in, actually, it's quite interesting. In December 2002, a professor in Japan worked out pi to about just over one trillion decimal places. That's a big number, and I'm not sure why he did it. He was probably not very busy. <laughs> Anyway, all you have to do to get this figure, you multiply the diameter by pi, and voila, you should get at least 31, not 30, like it, say, like it says in the Bible. So the question is, does God not know geometry? Is that why God did this? So w this is the single one that you will get attacked when, you, when you're doing a debate on the internet or you're talking to somebody, some ignorant will come along and say, the Bible is scientifically inaccurate, have a look at this. God doesn't even know pi. You know, that's the kind of ar argument they use. Well, is the Bible scientifically accurate? Well, yes, it is. This is, this is the problem. What people miss out is the following um, verses. It says, it was a handbreadth thick for, for the brim. Now, that's a lot of brass. That's because it was a very huge bowl. If you take two handbreadths away from 10 cubits for the thickness of the brass, you get exactly 30 cubits round the inside. I was going to explain how that's worked out, but there is no point. I know from previous experience that no one cares how it's worked out, and no one has ever thanked me for it. <laughs> so if you're interested, just have a look at the screen. That's how you work it out. I've done it so that people who care about mathematics can see this. But all you need to know is this, that the Bible got it right, okay? That's all you need to know. So. You see, here's the thing. What the Bible was trying to tell us is the diameter was very important, and it went from the outer edge to the other outer edge because you want to know how wide you need to do your door so that it gets through the door. And the circumference from the inside is done from the inside of it, not from the outside, is so that you know how much liquid you can put in it. Okay, so that's why the Bible talked about the outside brim to brim, whereas the inside, the circumference, and that's the difference between 31 and 30 in, in circumference. So is the Bible scientifically accurate? Yes, it is. You're near the end now. How exciting. Okay, but before we go, although this is part one now, uh, before we get to the second half, the second half, this is what we're going to do. We're going to, do some, we're going to make some scientific predictions based on biblical verses. We're going to see whether the Bible is not just scientifically accurate, but help us to predict things about geology, about the earth, and so on. We're going to find out whether that's true, and I'm going to give you an example of what we're looking for here. I'm going to be giving you some verses, and this is an example of a verse. It's going to be at the back. I want you to look at it. And here's an example of what I'm looking for. The, the first 10 words in the Bible, that's Genesis 1-1, it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So based on those 10 words alone, what scientific prediction can you make? I want you to think about this. It's something to do with the origin of space. Okay, it's saying that the universe has 
what? What does the universe have? It has a beginning. Okay, now this is apparent, this might be quite obvious to us today that the universe has a beginning, but did you know until the last century that nobody believed or the majority of people didn't believe that the universe had a beginning? Did you know that? They thought that the universe is self-existing and self-generating. They thought the universe always existed. That's what they thought. They didn't know it had a beginning. They called it, they had a name for it, it was called the steady state universe. This guy called Fred Hoyle uh, was a scientist who strongly believed in that. And did you know that the reason why the Big Bang Theory was so popular was because it promoted the idea of a beginning. That's why it was so popular. Not that the Big Bang is actually a, science, a, a sound science uh, prediction. It's just because it has a beginning and it makes sense because the universe does have a, be have a beginning. Now, God told us this over 4,000 years ago. It would have saved a lot of trouble and hassle. We could have just simply understood it from what the Bible says. So I'm just going to give you, in case you're interested, the Big Bang idea originated in 1927. I'll just give you this for nothing. By a priest, of all people. He called, his name was George Lemaitre. He was French. Uh, he was a French astronomer, professor of physics. He didn't call it the Big Bang. This is what he actually called it. He called it a homogeneous universe of constant mass and growing radius, accounting for the radial velocity of extragalactic nebula, mouthful. Uh, so why do we call it the Big Bang? If that's what this guy came up with, why are we calling it the Big Bang? You see, that's because Fred Hoyle, who was being interviewed on radio in 1949, he referred to it as the Big Bang, and he was taking the mic. Remember, it was competing with his theory. Uh, because he called it the steady state universe, and um, there was this big bang thing coming. So he was taking the mic. He said, what do you mean, like the big bang? And he was taking the mic. That's what it was, and it got stuck ever since. And I'm very grateful for it, because it's much easier to remember that than what he said. You see, when the Bible says, in the beginning, we can scientifically predict that there was a beginning. It's very easy. That's the point I'm making. So I've got many verses like that at the back. I want you to read and tell me what kind of prediction would you make if you just simply had those verses to go by, go by and nothing else. You might match them with an existing prediction or existing law we know about. I'm happy with that. I just want you to read it and tell me what you would come up with if that was a prediction that you wanted to make from the Bible. So biblical verses at the back. And if you get it right, I've got a present for you. Oh, come on. Absolutely. We've got a present for you. In fact, uh, what I'll do, I've got three presents, and we can go and we can select three winners, and you can get those. In fact, there's a booklet to do with 101 scientific facts about the Bible. That complements today's talk. So if you do that, I will have that present ready for you, and we will reveal the winner in the second half. But this is end of part one. I want to th thank you all for listening. Please do come back for part two. It's uh, more interesting. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. So far, in the first half, we looked at physics, oceanography, the study of the sea, hydro hydrology, which is study of distribution of water on Earth, uh, meteorology, the atmospheric and uh, weather conditions, astronomy, biology, study of life, living plants and animals, geometry. And now we're going to look at the rest of our scientific fields here, which we're looking for is this. We're looking at geology, uh, which is study of rocks and Earth, Paleontology, study of fossils and organisms. Uh, chemistry, archaeology, study of him, human history through excavation and uh, artifacts. And medicine. Wow. Okay, it's going to be quite a lot of stuff, right? Okay, I want you to be ready. Because first of all, we're going to be looking at some predictions. Okay, we've been looking at, I've given you some verses, and for you to come up with some predictions that would fit today's laws that we find. Okay, the first one I gave you was, he stretched out the heavens. In fact, I said there were 17 verses that supports the idea that the heavens were stretched out. Okay, so therefore, if the Bible is correct, I predict that everywhere we look, we will see evidence of the universe expanding. Okay, because if he stretched out the heavens, I would expect the universe to be expanding. And lo and behold, indeed, everywhere we look in the universe, we actually see stars that are red-shifted. Red-shifted means that objects are moving away from us. That means the universe is indeed expanding. So clearly, if I was just following what the Bible said and believed it, I would find out or I would predict that the universe is indeed expanding. 
So therefore, my prediction would match what we really did find. How about this verse? For in six days the Lord made the heavens and earth, and on the seventh day he rested. Well, what can we predict from this? Well, if the Bible is true, then I predict that creation was a one-time event because he created within six days, and after that he did not create any longer. The seventh day he rested, therefore he did not create. One-time event only. And that not only that, that I would predict that you cannot create anything nor destroy anything. I will predict that if it was a one-time event, you will no, not be able to destroy anything and you will not be able to create anything from scratch. Now, I'm going to explain what I mean by saying that. When I say you can't create anything, I mean you can't create a single atom or energy. Or you, can, you can swap matter and energy together, but you cannot create anything from scratch. You can swap between them. For example, if you have a chair and you want to destroy it, you can burn it but you cannot destroy it completely. You're changing into ashes and smoke. Actually, it still exists. Every particle still exists. You can't make it completely disappear into thin air. And likewise, you can't make something appear from thin air or from nothing. You can't do that. Okay, so that's what I'm saying when I say after the six days, that would be impossible because God said it was done after the sixth day. Well, what do you know? It turns out that we have a law, a specific law that we discovered that says exactly that, and it's called the first law of thermodynamics, which says energy and matter can be transformed. You can change energy to matter and vice versa, but cannot create or destroy it. Okay, how incredible is that? This law is saying you can't get something from nothing. That's what it's saying. Now, there, here's the problem. If you can't get something from nothing, then using this law and alone, I can prove that we do not exist. Oh, that's quite fascinating. Remember, this law says you can't get something from nothing, yet we exist. The question is, who did it? If it's not nature, because the law says it couldn't, we couldn't be created from nature, because the law says you can't create something from nothing, then who created it? Now the question is, can God be the answer? Can God be the answer? Well, according to this, no. According to this, we are not allowed to say that God is the answer because according to this scientist, he says no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated, materialism, material things, is absolute for we cannot allow a divine foot into the door. So on one hand, according to the evolutionist, God cannot be the answer. And according to the law of physics, you can't get something from nothing. So basically, if you believe in evolution, you deny your own existence because of this law. This law makes it very clear. You can't get something from nothing. So if you're an evolutionist, you will deny your own existence, which is remarkable. That's why the Bible says in Psalm 14:1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You have to be a fool to say that. They rather deny their own existence than to admit that God is the creator or God is the answer. Does that sound rational to you? Does that sound like open-mindedness? It it's not even scientific to think that way. Either way, the Bible is certainly accurate scientifically, and it could certainly be used to make scientific predictions just like that one. Have a look at this one. The earth and the heavens will perish. That's one of the other verses you had to work with. They will all grow old like a garment. And this one, the heavens will vanish away like smoke. The earth will grow old like a garment. So what does this mean? What kind of prediction can I make from a verse like this? I'm going to give you two clues. Clue number one, the Bible says that things go from good to bad. It's not the other way around. Things go from good to bad. That's what it's saying. It can grow old like a garment. It's going from good to bad. Things go from order to disorder. That's what it's saying on the, in those verses. The second clue is that we discovered this very scientific law that supports this particular verse about a hundred years ago. We discovered it. And here it is. It's called the second law of thermodynamics, which says that every system left to its own devices always tends to move from order to disorder. Creation can easily predict this kind of law, that it's a universal principle. As a Christian, you would predict this and you would say, I can account for it. The Bible says it is, and therefore I can account for it. God put it in place. But if you're in evolution, you will have a great problem with this law because your philosophy is that everything goes from good to better. You know, everything expands. You can't even account for this particular um, law of physics. You can't account for it. 
you can't account for it, you can't even explain it because your philosophy is that everything gets better. Remember, big explosion and all the planets are revolving, revolving around themselves in perfect order. Yeah, that goes from chaos to order. Whereas this law says it's the other way around. So if you're an evolutionist, you would have a great problem explaining this particular theory. So the creationist says based on the fall of man, everything has gone from order to disorder. That's why it happens. Whereas if you're an evolutionist, you can't account for it. And the Bible told us this 3,000 years ago. How incredible. Does the Bible help you to do good scientific predictions? Of course it does. Have a look at this one, the paths of the sea. What does it mean? What does the paths of the sea mean? In the mid-1800s, there was a famous guy called Matthew Murray, and he was an American astronomer, historian, meteorologist, that's the science of atmosphere and weather conditions, we said that before, and cartographer, which is the study of making maps and charts, an author, geologist, educator, and he worked for United States Navy. I don't know how he had time to do that. But, um, but actually what he's most famous for, as if that's not enough, is that he was an oceanographer. This, in CBN News it says this about this guy. What many people don't know is that Murray was a committed believer, a staunch defender of the Bible. That means he was a strong defender, a firm defender of the Bible as a source of science. He actually believed that the Bible was scientifically accurate. His nickname was Pathfinder of the Seas. They called him that because his favorite verse in the Bible was Psalms 8.8 where it talked about the paths of the seas. He was convinced that if the Bible said there are paths in the seas, there's going to be paths in the seas. That's how he took it. It's quite straightforward. So he went to look for it. What's interesting is that when, his, when this was written 3,000 years ago, the only sea that the ancient Hebrews would have known about would have been the Mediterranean Sea, the Red Sea, the inland lakes, lakes such as the Dead Sea or the, um, the Sea of Galilee. And none of these seas had any currents whatsoever. In fact, David, who wrote this, would have probably never seen an ocean. How incredible. And he wrote this. And despite that, Mary trusted the Bible. And he said, well, if it says there's paths in the sea, I'm going to go and find it. And guess what? He found it. And when he found it, he immediately revolutionized travel altogether. This article goes on to say, <clears throat> goes on to say Mary's findings affected business immediately. It cut sailing times by, by weeks, even months, on long voyages and saved millions in the process. This guy said that the commercial impact was phenomenal. It's almost as if jet planes had been introduced to the transatlantic travel. What's even more fascinating is that during this time in the mid-1800s, Charles Darwin was going around, busy drawing attention to his theory of evolution, dissing the Bible. In the meantime, Mary, who was also known as the scientist of the sea, was proclaiming the Bible is scientifically accurate. How incredible is that? And he was making all these amazing discoveries in the name of the Bible, in the name of God's Word. Mary said that the Bible is true and science is true, and therefore the truth of the, of the other, if truly read, proves the truth of each other. The short version of that is they're both true and they confirm each other's truth. That's what he's saying. The Bible and science prove each other. Matthew Murray, textbook on oceanography is still taught in universities today. Can the Bible be used to make scientific predictions? Yes, it can. The Bible is scientifically accurate and can be used for scientific predictions. How about this one? The Bible talks about a global flood that covered the whole earth. All people, plants and land and sky animals were buried quickly, and the whole process took about 371 days. All this happened 4,400 years ago. Make a note. The global flood, 4,400 years ago. If this is true, then what kind of prediction would we make in geology? What would we expect to see in the rocks? I'll give you a clue. If you take a jar of water and fill it up with dirt and soil and shake it up violently and nicely and then let it sit down to rest, you will find that it will automatically sort itself into layers, into layers of gravel, sand, silt, and, and clay, and so on. So it will automatically, if you <coughs> get a jar of water, fill it up with all this stuff, shake it up, you'll get automatic layers. Well, if that science is correct and the earth was covered with water, 
then I can make some predictions. I will predict that there would be layers in the rocks today, everywhere you look. Then they will call them sedimentary layers. I predict that these layers will be flat like pancakes. I predict that, the lo that, that there would be no erosion marks between those layers because they would have been laid down very quickly. And I would predict that there would be no soil layers between those layers. I predict that people who don't believe in the Bible would be very puzzled by this and make statements like this. Did millions of years fly by with no discernible effect? It just won't make sense to them. You see, people tell you that the Colorado River carved the Grand Canyon with a little bit of water over a long period of time. Well, I would say that the Grand Canyon was carved with a lot of water with very little time. Well, if the Bible is true, then all of this happened during the global flood. That's true. Then I predict that the Grand Canyon walls would be steep. If it happened very quickly, the walls would be very steep because of waters rushing through. And that's exactly what we would see. Everywhere you look in the Grand Canyon, you see steep water walls. The walls are very steep because it suggests rushing water. Also predict that there will be no delta. That's the dirt that the river is supposed to wash away. Well, they would supposed to accumulate somewhere. If you have water that's trickling through over millions of years, the dirt will accumulate somewhere. And if that's the case, then where did all the dirt go? It makes perfect sense if it was all done during the global flood with loads of water that washed away all the dirt. Also, how come the top of the Grand Canyon is higher than where the river enters the Grand Canyon? By about four to 6,000 feet. It, that means if you're an evolutionist, you believe that water flows or river flow upwards. I mean, that would make no sense whatsoever. It doesn't make sense. So the Bible is scientifically accurate, and we can rely on the Bible to make scientific predictions. Well, we believe the Bible is scientifically accurate. In fact, it's accurate in geology as well. So we're going to move on to the next one. If all people, plants, lands, and sky animals were buried, then what would you predict to see in those layers? Well, I give you the first clue. To become fossilized, a plant or animal must be buried quickly to prevent decay and must be undisturbed throughout the process. Clue number two, fossilization requires sudden death, sudden burial, and great pressure. I predict that we will actually find fossils in those layers. You see, if the global flood didn't occur, then why do we have fossils in layers? You don't get animals dying today and hanging around for millions of years courteously waiting for those layers to come along over millions of years so that we can go and find them later on, do they? No, they decompose well before that or they disarticulate. So the only way you can actually get fossilization is if you had a global flood that occurred all at the same time and they were all buried very quickly with water because you need that to create fossilization. Therefore, if the Bible is true, you will find quick fossilization, quick fossilization, not slow ones, such as for plants, snails, and even jellyfish. I mean, did you know snails and jellyfish are like 98% water? They don't hang around for a long time after they die. They quite kind of melt after a few days or weeks, at, at the most months. They don't hang around for millions of years waiting to be buried. And I also predict that you will see fossilized fish. Now, I'm not a fish but I'm sure a fish doesn't need millions of years to have their lunch. That one is still having it there. This one didn't even get to digest its food. And this one is still in the middle of giving birth. Ladies, you better hope that's done by the global flood. You really don't want it to take millions of years to give birth, do you? If the global flood caused fossilization, then I also predict that there would be places with loads of fossils appearing altogether fossilized. What a surprise. They do. All around the world, we have them. They even have a name for it. It's called fossil graveyards. Perhaps the most famous is this 40 square mile area in Ashley Beds in the United States. It has a huge number of animals and people all in one place. Here is one in South Africa with 800 billion fossils. Wyoming, Mor Morrison Formation, and so on. Why would fossils desperately want to go to one place and die altogether. Why would they want to do that? It wouldn't make sense. I don't think that's how it happened. I believe it's probably because there was a great big flood and it caused such a mess. Every animal and every creature just jumbled up and got together and they were buried very quickly. 
They say you can use the Bible to make some good scientific predictions because the Bible is scientifically accurate. So, the Bible turns out to be also scientifically accurate in paleontology. Let's have a look at the next one in chemistry. Now, we all agree that coal and oil actually come from living things. Oil comes from organisms that once lived, and of course, coal from plants. We all agree with that one. Not many people would com complain about that. But they tell us that it took millions of years to form coal. That's what they say. They were buried over millions of years, and it takes millions of years. But according to the Bible, if these layers occurred 4,400 years ago, over a period of about 371 days, which is what we said, how long the water went, stayed over the uh, uh, surface of the earth, then I predict that we should be able to make coal within a few days or weeks. That's what I predict, because that's what the Bible says, how the global flood occurred. Well, guess what? This scientist called Robert Gentry did exactly that. He produced coal from a piece of wood within a few weeks, and he published his findings in 1976 issue of Science. And also, if the Bible is true, I predict that we'll make oil very quickly. You see, if all of these things were buried very quickly, 4,400 years ago, over a period of 371 days, and we're finding oil, well, that means we should be able to make oil ourselves within a short period of time, not millions of years, as they tell you. Well, guess what? Oil can be made in 20 minutes. They've done, they've done this in 1971 in a laboratory. They've also got a plant that changes sewage sludge to oil in 30 minutes. That's very quick. There's a factory in Texas that takes turkey guts, pressurizes, and heats them, and turns them into oil. They say in this article, we duplicate what Mother Nature does, but what Mother Nature took millions of years to do, we do in 30 minutes. Now, I've got a question. How do you know it took millions of years to make oil, or Mother Nature to make oil, when we can make them in minutes? How do we know that? Maybe they're all mistaken. Maybe it really happened just like the Bible said. 4,400 years ago, there was a great big flood, covered the whole earth for approximately 371 days, and during that time, we had coal and oil, just like we can make them now. Can the Bible be used to make scientific predictions? Yes, it can. Okay, they tell us it takes 1 to 3.3 billion years to form a diamond, but according to the Bible, all the layers happened 4,400 years ago, and it covered the earth for 371 days. So, I can make a prediction. My prediction is, if all of that happened over a short period of time, then we should be, be able to make diamonds today, over a short period of time. Well, guess what? Here is a company that's making just that. They're called LifeGem UK. You can call them if you want. In fact, they make diamonds for a living from your loved ones. That's right, not for your loved ones, from your loved ones. It's saying here, a certified high quality, not any old diamond, by the way, high quality diamond created from a lock of hair or the cremated ashes of your loved one as a memorial to their unique life. Basically, they take someone you love you cremate them, you take the carbon out of it, they put it into a big machine, and they make a diamond out of it that you can wear. How are they doing this? I thought it takes billions of years to make this. Well, according to this frequently asked question section, they say they created a certified high-quality diamond in just a matter of months. See, it doesn't take billions of years to make a diamond. Just a few months. Here's an interesting part. The people who are making this are not claiming that they make reasonably high-quality diamonds. They're not claiming that. They're saying that they are identical in every aspect to the natural one, to the natural diamonds we get, and it's the same quality as the ones you buy from Tiffany's. The quality you buy from Tiffany's, who they get out of the ground, it's the same quality as that one. See, you can make some good sound predictions using the Bible, using God's Word. If all these things happened during the global flood, then clearly we could make them today, and as it happens, we can. Can the Bible be used to make scientific predictions? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, I've got two more people are responding saying yes, so we're nearly there. Okay, so the Bible is obviously scientifically accurate in chemistry. Let's check out archaeology. Let's see if in archaeology the Bible is accurate. 
This one is very simple. If the layers were all laid down very quickly during the global flood, I expect to see so many out-of-place artifacts that they will have a special name for it. That's what I predict. So, but if evolution is true, then you have to think about this. Coal is supposed to have happened over millions of years. Well, humans didn't exist at that time, according to their schedule, according to their chart. So that means I shouldn't find any artifacts whatsoever. Okay, but guess what? This is uh, what we find. We find iron pots embedded in coal. We find a shoe sole embedded in coal. A gold chain, iron thimble, drill bit, or bora, coins, cuboid shape tool, carved stone plate bearing the image of a man's face. All these things are found in coal seams. They don't announce those things because it actually goes against the evolution theory. They couldn't announce that, then people will have questions, wouldn't they? They will ask, well, why are they there? These things are found in so many places. They have got their name for it, ready-made. It's called Oop Arts, which means out-of-place artifacts. You can get books about this subject, and they're actually out there in the back. You can even just look at it. These are the two books. Just have a look at it later on. You'll be amazed. In fact, look, one of them is nearly a 1,000 pages telling you all about it. That's the abbreviated version to tell you how many Oop Arts they found throughout the uh, coal seams. Absolutely incredible. What we find today totally matches what the Bible tells us. It, the Bible can be used to make scientific predictions because the Bible is God's Word and it's scientifically accurate. You see, the Bible is even accurate in archaeology. Let's have a look at medicine. Let's see if the Bible is accurate in medicine. In Leviticus 11, it says, if an animal you are permitted to eat dies and you touch it, touch its carcass, or carry away its carcass, you must wash your clothes. Hmm, that's interesting. In chapter 17, it says, And every person who eats what died naturally or what was torn by beasts, whether he is a native of your own country or a stranger, he shall both wash his clothes and bathe in water. And again, it says, And when he who has a discharge, that's referring to disease and illness, by the way, is cleansed of his discharge, then he shall count for himself seven days for his cleansing, wash his clothes, and bathe in his body, uh, bathe his body in running water, then he shall be clean. If I'm dealing with some sort of an illness, or if I touch a dead body, then I should be going out there and washing my hands in running water, otherwise something bad will happen, like I'll catch a disease or something. It's not saying that, it's just saying, don't do it, wash your hands, or else. It's an, um, kind of an uh, instruction. This is exactly what this guy found the hard way. His name is Ignaz Philipp Simmelweis. He lived in the 1800s. He was an obstetrician. That's a man who looks after women who are pregnant and, uh, and child, during their childbirth. He was a director of a very prestigious medical hospital called Vienna General Hospital in Austria. He discovered that up to 30% of the pregnant women who checked in his ward actually died. And some say it went up to 35%. Check out the sources. It's all over the internet. This information is easy to get to. It was no different in Austria, the Americas, Britain, Ireland, and practically every other nation. Semmelweis was so concerned about this, he went to every length to solve this problem. Why are these women dying? He actually came up with several things. He even made them lie on one side. I don't know why he would do that, but uh, it didn't help. He was getting very desperate. It turned out that he noticed that his medical doctors that were going to examine, who went to examine the dead woman, went off and washed their hands in a bowl in a stagnant water bowl of bloody water and went off to examine the patients afterwards. He noticed they were doing that. The reason they did that is because it says here there seems no reason for them to wash their hands except superficially or change their clothing before coming to the first division. The first division is where all these women were dying. So they did neither. It, to us, that whole idea sounds crazy now, not to wash your hands. I mean, no doctor today would... would even dream of touching a dead body and then without washing their hands and changing their clothes go and examine a living patient. Nobody would even dream of that. But back then, they haven't even heard of germs. And uh, they thought illnesses were caused by atmospheric conditions, believe it or not, cosmic telluric um, uh, influences that's like dark evil cloud thing. So that's what they thought was killing them. Um, that's what disease was all about. At the end, you know what Simmelweis did? 
to the doctors, he made them all wash their hands. He discovered that doctors themselves were spreading the disease. When he did this, do you know what happened when he made them wash their hands? This is what happened. The mortality rates dropped to 1.27%, and by March and August of 1848, within one year, no woman died in childbirth in his division. You know what his reward was for this? He was ridiculed, harassed, and sacked. It was for political reasons. They couldn't hack it. They said, you, who are you to tell us? It goes against the teaching of the day. Don't tell us what to do. So they sacked him. This guy was so angry that they wouldn't listen to him. They thought he went mad. So you know what happened? They put him in an asylum. And within 14 days, he died in the asylum of infection, ironically. The very thing he was trying to stop. God told Moses almost 3,300 years before Simmelweis was born to do just that, to wash the hands and clothes with running water, not stagnant water like they did. It would have saved loads of people. How incredible is that? And they would have had no hassle if they would have just listened. That's what happened. It turns out that the Bible is also accurate in medicine. It's accurate in every single field. The Bible is scientifically accurate by which we can make scientific predictions. I just want to tell you something else about Simmelweis. In fact, the Simmelweis ordeal was so bad, there is now a metaphor named after him called Simmelweis reflex or Simmelweis effect. It means it's a tendency to reject new evidence or new knowledge because it contradicts the established norm, beliefs, or scientific discipline. How interesting. Simmelweis reflex is what's happening today. Isn't that incredible? Our schools, government, um, scientific community are rejecting the evidence of creation just because it goes against the established norm today. Not because it's wrong, by the way. We should have learned our lesson 150 years ago. Of course, that wasn't the isolated incident. I'm going to take the opportunity to show you a couple of incidents. Throughout history, people have done just this. The same happened to Galileo, who was an Italian astronomer, physicist, mathematician, philosopher. More important than all of that, he was a creationist. You need to make a note of that. Galileo was a creationist. You've heard how the church accused him of heresy for supporting the theory that the sun was uh, the center of the solar system, not the earth, which is what the, what the established teaching was of the, of the day. This was revolutionary in his time that he was making this claim because people believed in those days that everything revolved around the earth. The earth was the center of the universe. He was basically following the same footstep as Copernicus, who was also a creationist only a few years before him and uh, who believed uh, of the same thing, um, that uh, the sun was the center of the solar system through observation. That's the claim he made. So he was following his footsteps. But this is what they teach our kids today. Galileo was silenced by the Roman Catholic Church. That's what they tell our kids today. Galileo was branded a heretic for daring to adopt a radical new theory that Earth is not the center of the universe. For supporting Copernican theory, Galileo was tried by the Roman Catholic Church. He was not pardoned until 1988 when Pope John Paul II finally conceded that the church had made a mistake in 1988. That is what they're teaching our kids that actually happened during the days of Galileo. You know what you call this? Slanted journalism. What really happened was this, and this is documented in the Skeptical Inquirer. It is more historically accurate to conclude that the main opponents of the new Copernican position were the academics teaching science in the universities, and that much, if not most, of Galileo's support actually came from the church officials. It was actually the other way around. The church was supporting his right to claim his theory. And the academics of the day were actually refusing it because it went against the teaching of the day. This is the real problem. Galileo's idea was looked upon favorably by certain influential churchmen and scientists, causing jealousy in his rival scientists. So these other scientists were actually jealous of him because the church was giving him so much attention. The real opposition to Galileo were the academics who had their natural philosophies firmly based on Aristotle. Aristotle is the one who claimed that the earth was the center of the solar system. The scientists of the day could not let go of their theory. They could not let him go, and Galileo was a threat to them. So 
they went attacking him. To make matters worse, church honored Galileo. And they were jealous of the special treatment Galileo was given by the church and of his large salary. You know what Galileo ended up having? having? The church gave him a pay rise. So they went mental even more because Galileo was being given so much attention. During a visit to Rome, Galileo met with Pope uh, Paul III. After that, they were fighting over honoring him. Galileo was so pleased, he said that the church and society were on his side. What more could he ask? Wow, what a twist to the story. It turned out the other way around. It's like the flat earth syndrome all over again. It wasn't the Christians who were doing that. The reason why the church fell out with Galileo was because of his rash indiscretion, his insistence on throwing open to the common people a question that was far from being settled. He wanted to force, Galileo wanted to force his theory on the people, and the church went, hold your horses, hold back, hold back. Before you start ramming it down their throats, be courteous and prove your theory first. That's all they were asking for. Evolutionists have basically what they've done, they've, They've taken the event and distorted it to make, to make it look like the church went against them. But in actual fact, it was them who were going against, the, the academics of the day were going against Galileo. And it had nothing to do with science. Um, it was just their belief. It was going against their community, scientific community. What they don't tell you today is that most of the scientific discoveries were made by scientists that were creationists. Some may not have been Christians, by the way, but they were still creationists. Here's a quick short list. There are some famous names here that we recognize like Kepler, Pascal, Boyle. So these are names of people who are founders of our science that we, we work, we base our theories on. Not to mention Isaac Newton. He was known as the greatest and the most influential scientist who ever lived, creationist. And let's not forget John Harris. I hear he's very famous. <laughs> okay, I'm not that old though. Um, Scientists like George Cuvier, Matthew Murray, we just spoke about Matthew Murray. He's uh, known as the Pathfinder of the Seas. We talked about him. Um, Thomas Chalmer, Michael Faraday, Samuel Morse, the, uh, the invention of Morse code, creationist. Charles Babbage, the inventor of the first mechanical computer, creationist. Richard Owen, a paleontologist who coined the word dinosaur. He, invented, he coined that word dinosaur, which means terrible reptile or fearfully great reptile. Uh, also, people like James Joule, known for the first law of thermodynamics. We talked about that earlier. George, uh, sorry, Gregor Mendel, he's known for the father of modern genetics, came from a creationist. Louis Pasteur discovered the law of biogenesis, the idea that life only comes from life. You can't create, create life from non-life. So if you're an evolutionist and you believe in evolution, you go against that law, and therefore that makes you unscientific. That's why I call evolution unscientific. Did you know that originally, the original Greeks actually believed exactly in that? They believed that the goddess of Gaia was capable of creating life from nothing. In fact, was capable of creating life from a rock. That was the goddess of Gaia that the ancient Greeks believed in. And what a coincidence, the evolutionists believe in exactly that. William Thompson Calvin, who was known for all these discoveries, I'm not going to read through them for you, and the creationists, James Maxwell, all this list, they're all creationists. James Maxwell, known for his dozen of discoveries. One of them is the durable color photograph. Uh, John Fleming, he's known for inventing the first vacuum tube, and he was famous for the left-hand rule for electric motors. You know what's really fascinating about all these people is that all of these discoveries, if you look at them, happened roughly after the Bible was translated into English or other languages, in languages that people can read and understand and suddenly discover that there is order to the universe. They approach their whole discoveries and their whole science from a point of view of understanding that there is order to the universe. There is purpose, there is design, there is intelligence behind it all. And that, and that they realize that all of that reflects God's attributes. And they made all these amazing discoveries because they were creationists. Absolutely incredible. With that mindset, they were able to make some fantastic, discover fantastic laws of science. And by the way, most of those creationists were young earth creationists. They believed that the world was between six to 10,000 10, years old. It's absolutely incredible. The Wright brothers were creationists. They studied God's design, designed birds and developed the airplane. 
Dr. Raymond Dem the median known as the man who invented, invented the MRI. In 2003, they were giving out the Nobel Prizes and he was supposed to win the Nobel Prize for his discovery of MRI. This is only recent. He didn't get it. Do you know why? Because he was a creationist. He did not get the Nobel Prize because he was creationist. He was so shocked and so annoyed, he went out and pull, put full page adverts in the uh, New York Times and the Washington Post that cost him personally over $200,000 to expose it all. It made no difference. And it, you can read all about it in the BBC News website. It's all there. Even this atheist philosopher Michael Ruse said, I cringe at the thought that Raymond Demidian was refused his just honor because of his religious belief. You know why that happened? Because evolution is not science. Evolution is a religion, is in fact anti-science. And they are the people who are running the show for now. And that's why creationists are being victimized, victimized in this way. And this is only in 2003. Robert Gentry, he's the world-renowned nuclear physicist. He submitted uh, papers to the scientific community. And uh, when they discovered that what he was submitting was confirming the Genesis account of creation, because it was a scientific paper, you know what, what happened? They shut him down. They removed his material, and you know what he had to do? He took them to court. He took them to court, but they still wouldn't publish his material. He submitted 10 scientific papers, and, and the publishers instantly refused them, instantly, because it was supporting a biblical principle. And you can read all about it in halos.com. The New World Encyclopedia said the incident raises questions of academic censorship. And I agree. It raises a lot of questions about censorship. Some people tell me, look, John, if what you're saying is all true, how come we never hear about this? And I say, well, that's the nature of censorship. You don't get to hear about it. <laughs> that's what happens when you're censoring something. If you thought that was uh, uh, amazing, well, and you thought that was in the past? Well, you're going to be surprised, because only yesterday afternoon, hot out of the press, BBC News announces that failing to teach evolution by natural selection in science lessons could lead to new free schools losing their funding under government changes. So if you don't teach evolution, you lose your money. Is that science? Goes on to say, if a school teaches creation as a scientific fact or does not teach evolution, the Department of Education will take swift action, which could result in, a term, in the termination of that agreement. It was del deliberately referred to as the creationist myth, okay, called slanted journalism. It's outright biased, outright biased. I have a question. Why is the government interfering with showing favoritism in one theory over another. Why is the government interfering? It's not a political question, is it? It's not the government's place to um, enforce a certain theory or another. I thought it was a question of science. Isn't that what it's supposed to be? And why are they taking sides? Andrew Copson, chief executive of British Humanist uh, Association, is actually running a campaign to teach evolution, capital T, capital E and not creation. Why? Why is he so concerned? Why can they not realize that this kind of behavior, call it, teaching them one theory and calling it a fact, is not indoctrination? How can they not see that? You see, education is when you show them both sides and let science speak for itself and the student make their own decision. Indoctrination is when you show them only one side, call it a fact, and no other sides. Isn't that how Soviet Union used to run? Besides, what are they all worried about? If evolution can withstand the evidence, and if there is evidence to support it, then why are they worried that creation comes into the school? What, what, if the evidence all supports evolution, then why are they worried? Maybe the evidence doesn't support evolution, and they need to do this kind of censorship against creation that would actually affect their theory. I would say they have reasons to worry because the facts doesn't support it. There are hundreds of scientists, if not thousands of scientists, who don't accept the theory. This is the whole website dedicated for scientists who can sign up and speak up against this theory. Here's a short list of these names. This professor said, I suppose that nobody will deny that it is a great misfortune if an entire branch of science becomes addicted to a false theory, but this is what has happened in biology. I believe that one day the Darwinian myth 
will be ranked the greatest deceit in the history of science. When this happens, many people will pose the question, how did this ever happen? If you want to know what happens to scientists speak against the theory of evolution, get this DVD later on, uh, who shows you many examples of real life situations. There are thousands of scientists who are creationists who believe that you can make sound scientific predictions and inventions following the Bible. You see, the Bible can be trusted. It is scientifically accurate, and you can do good scientific studies and predictions through it. I'm going to tell you one story, and then we're going to end. I believe our generations are missing out a great deal with not being taught these facts and these truths. A young man once uh, was called by a lawyer and said that his grandmother left him. This story actually appeared in the Evidence Bible. So those who have an Evidence Bible, you probably see the story in your Bible. He was called by, his law by a lawyer that said his grandmother, who died, left him an uh, inheritance. He got $50,000 and uh, a Bible that says, this is my Bible with all its contents. So he was very happy to get the $50,000, um, but he thought, well, the Bible, I know what it contains, so I don't have to look at it. I'll put it on a shelf somewhere. He didn't touch it. So he went off and gambled the $50,000. He became very poor. He was scrounging for food. He had very little to eat. And whilst he was weak and fragile, he, wa he moved with his relatives. And whilst he was moving, he reached out to his shelf, took the Bible to take it with him. And his fragile hands, he dropped the Bible, and it flung open. And he noticed that $100 came out of the page. It turned out every page had $100 in it. Can you imagine, a Bible has got about one and a half thousand pages. So it had a hundred dollars in each one of those pages. He didn't want to open it because he believed it knew what it contained. And therefore, because of his prejudice, he missed out so much during those years that he was living as a poor man. That's what we do today. We sometimes not read the Bible because we think we know what it contains. And we miss out on God's rich richness and fullness uh, of God's Word because we're prejudiced. You see, if the Bible is scientifically accurate, then what else is it right about? Could it be that the Bible is right about Jesus? That one day He will come back and judge the world? What if the Bible is right about that we are sinners and that the consequence of sin is death, hell, and punishment and eternal separation from God? What if it's right about all these things? Maybe it's right about these things too. But you know, the Bible talks about this thing called good news. You see, what happened is that God himself came down and he took our place of punishment so that we don't have to face the punishment ourselves. That's what the Bible tells us. And all we have to do is to accept him. All we have to do is to turn to Jesus and say sorry. That's called repenting. And then we turn away from the things that we've done and turn to God, accept Jesus as our Lord, and um, he will become our savior. And it's really as simple as that. You see, if the Bible is right about all these things, then he may be right about the part where we're sinners and the part where we have to repent and turn away and turn to Jesus and accept him as our Lord and savior and put our trust in him. You can't even do science without the Bible. And therefore, I suggest that we don't do life nor death without him either.